increasingly, uh, whether it's right or wrong, the world is going to judge the United Nations on its ability to protect civilians. When a peacekeeping mission is deployed and there is trouble, they run. Now where do they run to? The United Nations compound. Why? Because they expect protection. We're talking about millions of people who live in places in the world who for no uh, sort of fault of their own are somehow caught up. It's about our responsibility to protect those people. And at the heart of this are children, women, men, families, communities. There are regimes all over the third world which do not really care about their citizens. They, they do not do enough not just about protecting their basic rights, but even providing basic necessities for their citizens. So somebody needs to stand up for them. If you're not present, you can't protect. So it's very important that UN uh, peace missions, and in particular peacekeeping, be present. Uh, and above all, to intervene when needed to help protect those who cannot protect themselves. Today it is not sort of two well-trained, well-disciplined, well-equipped armies on a battlefield fighting over territory. That's sort of an, a, a very old image of, of what a, a war is. Today it's often civilian wars in failed states with unruly rebel groups. That means we have to adapt to a new reality. It is a totally new kind of warfare. The primary target of terrorism, for example, are civilians. It's not a strategic path or a strategic strait in an ocean. It is not territory. It is civilians. The requirement for peacekeeping missions to protect civilians was explicitly mandated for the first time as part of a peacekeeping mission in 1999. Since then, the UN Secretariat, troop and police contributing countries, host governments, humanitarian personnel and human rights actors have worked to interpret what this meant in practice. The initial idea of peacekeeping was really not a proactive one. Uh, it was just to be sort of a buffer between parties and to monitor. Earlier, war was between combatants, but now you really find that civilians are often just targets of war. And this has enormous implications because the Geneva Conventions, everything is based on the fact that civilians will be protected. And what is happening is that it's falling on the United Nations now more and more. What we saw during this decade of, of the 90s is that the UN was the impotent witness to immense horrors. It almost destroyed the UN because the, the confidence that the people should have in the organization was badly damaged by what we saw when uh, people who had expected the UN to protect them died. The series of tragedies in the 1990s made it clear that the traditional idea of peacekeeping was no longer appropriate. In Rwanda, and again in the Balkans, the United Nations found that there was no peace to keep, no opposing armies to separate, no ceasefire to maintain. There were civilians, and the United Nations, not having planned for them, failed them. The Security Council responded to these failures by placing protection of civilians on its agenda and by explicitly mandating for peacekeeping missions to protect civilians. POC is a very specific task that we received for the first time in 1999 in Sierra Leone. All our peacekeeping operations start with a mandate from the Security Council, and in the mandate, we receive more and more the famous sentence saying, you, the mission, has to protect civilians under imminent threat within its capability and its area of deployment. Those provisions have grown ever stronger in the new missions, including, for example, the one I led in, in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which put protection of civilians as our first priority. The question, as always, is how to do that. It is the host government that has the primary responsibility to protect its civilian population. 
Protection of civilians' activities, undertaken by peacekeeping missions, are aimed at creating the conditions which will enable the peacekeepers to leave. We're lucky enough to live in an environment where there is peace, uh, where political rule is not contested, where institutions are functioning. And that is what protects us, fundamentally. Functioning institutions that respond to a legitimate uh, system of government. And that's what we need to understand in situations that are coming out of conflict, that ultimately it is those same outcomes which will allow for sustainable protection of civilians. Building viable and, and stable states for the future and in giving people their dignity and their rights that they so deserve, protection of civilians is at the core of it. It involves very much helping very vulnerable people within the refugee population, particularly women who are at a much higher risk of sexual and gender-based violence. It involves helping children who have been separated from their families, who may be unaccompanied, who have been caught up in a mass exodus situation, fleeing problems in their own country. Whatever you're doing for a particular country is meant for that population, and if you cannot ensure that that population lives in conditions that are human, where they are able to lead normal lives, then I think you're missing the point. And indeed, if you're not protecting the civilians in a conflict zone or a post-conflict environment, why are you there? There is no agreed definition of POC amongst organizations in the sector. For example, humanitarian and international organizations who also do protection work understand POC differently to UN peacekeepers. This means that each protection actor has a responsibility to understand and respect how others contribute to enhancing the protection of civilians. Humanitarians have a fairly well-developed sense of what protection means for them. It's you know, short-term emergency assistance, life-saving assistance. The human rights crowd know what protection means for them. It's investigating abuses, it's documenting crimes, it's seeking justice. Because peacekeepers also require a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities when it comes to protection of civilians, an operational concept on POC, based on experience and lessons learned in the field, has been recently developed. Ultimately, it is these broader systemic, institutional and political solutions which will mean that the protection of civilians is sustainable. It will mean that the civilians can look to their own authorities for protection. And that's why I think one, one has to always remember um, when one looks at uh, peacekeeping situations that we can't lose track of the fact that um, a, a longer term sustainable peace uh, needs to be found. And that's why when we talk in peacekeeping about protection of civilians, we talk about it as having these three tiers. One is the protection through political process. Uh, everything that we do is, um, in fact, directly towards having a better political process to make peace more sustainable. And within that, protection is a very important part. So the second tier is the, uh, the protection from physical violence. And that actually is just not uh, in a reactive way trying to, to protect, but it means also prevention, uh, it also means deterrence. The third tier is uh, what we call creating or establishing a protective environment. And this goes to you know, capacity building of local forces, such as the, the police force in, in, in the local society. 